speech can't be suppressed because of the ideas that it expresses, no matter how offensive and wrong we might view those ideas to be. Did police avert a mass shooting in the picturesque mountain town of Whitefish, Montana when they apprehended a young man following a string of disturbing social media posts? A handful of citizens and activists believe so. We do a lot of hand-wringing and praying and calling for action after school shootings. Here's a case where potentially a school shooting was averted. Francine Rostin is one of two rabbis living in Flathead County and believes that she was the target of a deranged would-be shooter who ranted about killing the Jews and school children on his Twitter account. That young man is David Lenio, a 29-year-old short-order cook who moved to Montana a little over a year ago so he could snowboard the nearby slopes. He lived out of his van and apparently liked to tweet. The case works backwards because President's Day weekend the Copenhagen shooting happens. Um, he engages with somebody on Twitter in response to something they said. The gunman fired dozens of shots into a central Copenhagen cafe where an event on freedom of expression was being Police gathering right now near the scene of that deadly terrorist attack in Denmark. In the Danish capital Copenhagen. It all began on February 15th, 2015, the day after the shooting attacks on a Copenhagen cafe and synagogue. A publicist and political activist named Jonathan Hudson was tweeting about the tragedy when he noticed an account called Psychic Dog Talk Radio replying with anti-Semitic language and conspiracy theories. He researched David's Twitter account, went back, looked at everything based on what he could tell David lived in Oregon. So he called the Lynn County Sheriff's Office in Oregon to report this. I don't think anybody in Kalispell would have known about these tweets, but for Mr. Hudson reporting them to law enforcement and convincing them to investigate it. Hudson contacted authorities in Oregon before police figured out that Lenio actually lived in Montana, and police took Lenio into custody the next day. The county charged him with two counts, defamation and intimidation. It was the defamation charge that caught the attention of UCLA law professor Eugene Volokh. In America, prosecutions for, let's say, speech that expresses racial or religious hostility almost never happen in large part because uh, prosecutors recognize that that kind of speech is fully protected. This is a rare exception. Here, for whatever reason, the prosecutor decided to push the envelope and to argue the statute does apply to this kind of thing that many people would label hate speech. Montana's statute is so broad that it outlaws speech that subjects individuals or groups to hatred, contempt, ridicule, degradation, or disgrace. The county argued that by making statements such as the Holocaust has been proven a lie, Lenio defamed all Jewish people. Many statements about groups and statements about history are either themselves opinion or even if they're in a sense factual assertions, they're nonetheless factual assertions about the kind of historical or scientific or religious or political matters that we really need to have free debate on. I've been hearing over the last several years lots of people talking about hate speech. They say, well, is something free speech or is it hate speech? From a legal perspective, that's something like asking is something Free speech or is it unpatriotic speech? Well, it could be both, but unpatriotic speech is not a legally significant category. There's no First Amendment exception for unpatriotic speech. Same with hate speech. The criminal defamation statute is overly broad in two ways. First is that it doesn't define group, class, or association. It could be any distinct group of people, and it could be people named John. It could be public defense attorneys. Any group, any size, any way you wanted to define it. Secondly, actual malice is generally required to find someone guilty of defamation. The Montana court agreed, dismissing the defamation charge and ruling that the statute was overly broad and infringed on constitutionally protected speech. I think it was a good decision. I think we do have to protect um, freedom of speech. The problem was that his speech crossed the line into threats. Intimidation under Montana law is that their conscious intent is to cause someone to either do something or not do something under 
a threat. Getty argues that his client was just a frustrated guy, blowing off steam to a handful of Twitter followers. But Rabbi Francine Rostin thinks that Lenio is a menace who intended to harm her and others in the community. If you live in New York or New Jersey, where we lived, and you say you want to kill a rabbi, it's not really a specific threat. There are hundreds of thousands of rabbis <laughs> all over the area. If you're in the Flathead Valley and you say you want to put two in the head of a rabbi, and there are only two rabbis in the entire Flathead Valley, that's a serious threat. Threats aren't protected by the First Amendment, but were Lenio's online rants, rants that could have easily washed away into the vast ocean of online vitriol, credible, true threats? Lenio had retrieved his guns from a nearby storage facility a few days before his arrest, and he told police he was pleased that his words had caused them to beef up security at the local schools. One difficulty in the Lenio case is that while many of the threats were very general about Jews generally, some of them talked about synagogues being targeted and such. Montana is not exactly chock full of synagogues. From what I've seen of the case, I'm inclined to say that this probably wouldn't, shouldn't be seen as a, as a punishable true threat. But I do think that, that this, uh, that's a much closer question than the criminal defamation question, where there the First Amendment argument was really very solidly against that charge. Here, it's a closer issue, and in a lot of cases, it's a close issue. I think this is a very important case in the country. And if this speech is not defined as threatening, then I think we're in danger. This is the only case that I've had a crime reported in another state that was ultimately prosecuted here. And I think that that is the linchpin, is that somebody has to be threatened. It would be the equivalent of back in colonial days of somebody yelling on a street corner. He's not directing these at anybody. And that's the biggest problem with the state's case is that these are not directed to a specific person.